Uh, okay, uh, should I uh, read the, the question because it's ah, related okay. to me? or uh, Please, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to German aid, uh, Germany took the initiative uh, to find more patriots for Ukraine. Uh, where do you think any new patriot systems would come from aside from the US? Um, that's a great question. And um, it's it's really interesting because I, re I saw the... Um, the presentation by Kuleba and um, Baerbock, so our foreign minister and Kuleba, and I didn't interpret this um, as a new initiative led by Germany, to be honest. Um, although everyone reports on a new initiative, it was just more like, hey guys, search for everything and then send it to Ukraine, um, not like a full initiative like um, the, the Czechs are, for example, doing because Everyone is sending the money to to Czechia and they are buying all the ammunition. Um, so yeah, just want to point that out. I don't think it's in a, in a German initiative. It's just that Germany is calling on other nations to find air defense systems for Ukraine, specifically Patriots, um, together with Kuleba. Um, so first that. Second, um, I think that's that's very hard um, because there are not a lot. Of, Especially regarding patriots, um, there are not a lot of, uh, a lot of users um, who are willing to provide uh, Ukraine with patriots um, from the current ones within NATO, except from the US, it's just Germany and the Netherlands. Um, I'm not sure how many patriot systems uh, or batteries um, the Netherlands has, um, but I suspect it's, it's not a lot and they're not willing to provide them to Ukraine since they have only and it's not only that's great help but they've only given two launchers and missiles to ukraine um germany has already sent two out of our uh, 13 to ukraine and um the one of the remaining systems is got just a schooling system which is not fully functional um we had a lot of patriot systems stationed in other countries three in poland for example two in um in in uh, Slovakia, one in Lithuania uh, at the time. And so we have not really much to spare um, because we need most of them for NATO for the remaining. Um, the other ones we now get will get delivered. I think it was 2027, so in three years. So um, and I don't think that anyone who is now giving Patriots away to Ukraine and is newly ordering them is getting them faster. So people have to take into account that these systems would uh, miss in the other armies um, for like many years at least. And Patriot systems are also not very cheap, right? It's like one system, how much is it? 500, 600 million euros um, plus missiles, spare parts, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's a high share of what countries have provided to Ukraine in two years of the war, right? That's a huge commitment of a single country to send Patriot equipment to uh, to Ukraine and um, to the other countries. I believe Spain operates uh, Patriot, Sweden operates Patriot, um, Poland just recently. I don't think they will provide anything to Ukraine um, besides them mocking Germany not sending enough Patriot systems to Ukraine. Um, Sweden, maybe, um, but at the end, there's like, I, I really don't expect anything, to be honest. I'm, I'm very sorry, but maybe one system coming together from everybody else, um, but nothing more besides missiles and spare parts, maybe. Like, especially regarding Patriot. I mean, we, what we could do is order new ones for Ukraine, um, but... Uh, this will, of course, also take time. Um, I think it comes down to, to other air defense. Um, so Iris TSLM, which is already in production for Ukraine, Iris TSLS, which is already in production for Ukraine, SEMT, uh, NASEMS, which is also in production for Ukraine. So, yeah, and providing air defense capabilities from army stocks, of course. Um, I can't talk a lot about other nations i can just say germany doesn't have really air defense capabilities besides the patriots um we have given all the gepards to ukraine uh which we are not in the in service with our armies we don't operate irst uh, slm ourselves 
um, and wait for our systems until Ukraine got theirs. And yeah, so I, I really don't know what I should think of this initiative um, besides maybe some very small systems, maybe some ammunition and spare parts. I don't know if that's the answer you, you wanted, but that's the answer I, I can give you. Because all the other operators, I mean, I can look it up at Wikipedia very shortly because I really don't know. But I think the other nations are uh, nations not inside NATO, which are not aiding Ukraine at all. So, yeah. In for sorry, uh, f regarding Patriot, the only uh, country who actually can give Ukraine s many systems or more systems. Um, fast is the US because they operate how many Joseph do you know 60 70 something like this yeah something close to that yeah so they they can give but the problem is the eight of course so yeah yeah I mean it looks like um I want to say last year or a few months ago, we were we can't say for sure, but it looks like Ukraine bought a system directly from Raytheon and Raytheon like expedited it. Um, and this cost them kind of an arm and a leg to do that. So my guess would be based on that, that it's just real hard to come by. Uh, someone mentioned here, like, could we maybe get some from uh, Middle Eastern nations or like Gulf countries? Um, you know, I would guess based on the geopolitical situation happening there right now that they were already pretty hesitant to give up any kind of air protection. And now they're probably very hesitant. So um, yeah, I think as Maurice correctly pointed out, like in terms of Patriot batteries, and I think it was this week, it was mentioned, um, you know, Russia's using these hypersonic missiles now um, and, and ballistic threats. And I think that they mentioned that like Patriot's proven to be the one that's really effective against that stuff. I mean, obviously these other air defense systems work for other threats like cruise missiles and, and things like that. But I think they really stress that Patriot's been the one, um, you know, handling those really high level threats. Um, so yeah, it's very important. Uh, and I, yeah, I think ultimately it's going to be new production coming directly off of Raytheon's uh, production lines. And maybe if the U S can um, make some tough decisions and start, you know, uh, taking some, some batteries out of, uh, out of the U S and, and handing them to Ukraine, I think it would be money very well spent or equipment very well spent. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you always have to imagine that Patriot systems are freaking expensive, you know, and, and that's probably what a lot of countries are avoiding because that's a, a huge contribution at one time, right? I mean, like one Patriot battery is like most of the, for example, Belgian military aid to Ukraine for the whole year. Just to put that in perspective, I believe when I um remember jeff talking about i believe he said like something around 600 million and um they have for this year which which is a lot for for belgium you know um so that's a huge contribution to just go to the manufacturer and say hey we're spending 600 million or 500 million whatever go and deliver a patriot battery for ukraine it's like you can't give any more aid to ukraine when you don't get additional funding for the whole year and that's also what I always emphasize about um, Germany, for example. Although we have like uh, 7.1 something billion in military aid this year, um, before the start of the year, like over three, I believe it was like three and a half billion euros were already contracted. So it's more like four and something. And of these four and something uh, billions for this year, like most of the stuff is already contracted. And we just have April, right? It's people always forget how expensive um especially Patriot, but also other equipment is um to answer another question or um in a statement made by by Aussie um in in the chat maybe Europe needs to start working on an indigenous air defense system um just to because my English is not the best indigenous means Joseph like a locally produced like your own Okay, yeah, so like Iris TSLM, for example. Right. 
right? It's it's a German produced, completely German uh, produced system. And um, I think this is also, for example, which is great, um, the ESSI, yeah, the European Sky Shield Initiative, which was uh, launched by uh, Scholz. I know a lot of people criticize Scholz, but I think the ESSI was a great um, initiative by him that, um, to explain it very briefly, um, other nations buy the same air defense capabilities. You have um, Iris TSLM, for example, you have uh, Patriot on the other hand, and um, nations are working together, contracting together, and you know have the same air defense capabilities to make it operational uh, around the the nations around Europe. And um, like Austria is interested, Switzerland, Latvia, uh, Lithuania, they have contracts, and you know Germany, of course, also. There are a lot of countries involved in this, and this is um, some. Where I think that's locally produced. Um, Sam T is France Italian, when I remember right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's also a local one. It's not like there there only exists Patriots, right? It's not. Patriot is a great system, but we have locally produced air defense uh, systems um, with RST, uh, not SLM, but SLX, for example, which is under development right now. Um, there is a new air defense uh, system coming from Deal um, with greater range. I believe the range is then um, expanding from 40 to 80 kilometers. Um, so there, there's a lot of stuff going on. And that's just two examples with SMT. And there's, of course, NASAMS, um, you know, and... There's a lot of going on. I, I don't think we have issues with that. The only issue is the production rates, in my opinion. Yeah, I think I remember we were having a conversation at some point, like just, you know, some people in the Toshin group. And uh, I think probably John was saying, like, it'd probably be better for Europe to focus on certain, th for example, like, does Europe really need to develop their own fighter? Does Europe really need to develop their own Patriot system? What they should do is license US production, right? Like, he was saying like Germany should produce Patriot systems and missiles. That, and that seems smart to me. And then focus on developing other systems that they can't get easily from the US, right? Yeah. And I mean, we have that, right? Uh, we have um, the um, license production for, not for systems, but for missiles, for example, um, here in, in Germany, we'll get that started now. But the first missiles, um, I believe it was like 1,000 in total. Um, bought at MBDA Deutschland from Germany and some other nations together. I believe it was Germany 500 Patriot missiles and um, some other nations. And then together it was like 1000 in a contract. But also this production, and because this stuff is just starting now, um, gets delivered in a couple of years at, at first, right? And so it's not, um, yeah. And um, to answer a private question, because Jonathan said from Colby, Iris T production, missiles, radar production, but launchers and engagement control, maybe not. Um, as far as I know, the launchers are getting also produced a deal locally in Germany. And the um, TOC, the Tactical Operations Center, gets produced by Airbus. Um, I don't know if that's done in France or in Germany, to be honest. Um, but it's just one small part except for this everything else is produced locally in germany just to answer the private question jonathan you got another question loaded up or i can uh try one yeah uh, a couple here yes um so a couple from helen so we've got uh, uh i think there's consensus on this one if i'm not mistaken so uh russia seems to have changed tactic from massive attacks to continuous attacks on energy infrastructure i think this is this consensus this has been happening um uh, at at uh, an increased or continuous rate can ukraine's energy infrastructure be fixed before next winter i think there's broad agreement that um you know despite the uh russia's constant attempts to uh starve ukraine of energy uh that russia's attack last winter the winter that's just been uh, have been less successful than the winter prior i don't know yeah so i mean i uh 
I I read a report uh, during during the news report uh, from from Ukrainago, which is like the largest energy producer in Ukraine. There's a few other um, companies, but I would say that they're probably the people to talk to when it comes to like Ukraine's energy uh, situation. Um, they seem pretty confident that it's not going to be as bad as last winter. Um, that's that seemed to be something that they were fairly confident in. I don't think they were super confident in terms of their ability to repair everything. Um, it sounded like the hydroelectric is basically out of commission for the foreseeable future. That was kind of the vibe I got from their statements and that um, repairing a lot of this stuff, like they're still working on coming up with a mechanism to fund the repairs, right? So that would imply like, we don't really know when it's going to be done. If we don't even know how we're going to pay for it, then um, you know who knows when it's going to be done. So. Um, there are certainly a lot of people in Ukraine right now that are experiencing like rolling blackouts. Um, they basically like blackout occasionally to save power. Um, and, you know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of people in Ukraine right now as a result of uh, Russia's uh, targeted attacks. But I think that the um, it, it seems like the Ukrainians are conf uh, more confident than they were last year in their ability to to deal with the the attacks themselves and that it won't like shut the, the country down or the economy down. Um, but, you know, that said, it's I, I don't want to like um, under like undersell the, the current severity of the situation. There's a lot of people that are suffering um, severe humanitarian crisis as a result of Russia's like destruction of power infrastructure. And, you know, that that affects not just power for, you know, your your iPhone, it affects like the ability for them to purify water in the city and like move sewage around. And like, it's not just about like, you know, electricity. So um, it's a big deal. Um, but I think overall, it seems like they're pretty confident that they can keep the lights on, um, you know, in, in the country um, com better than last year. Um, I don't know. Anything else you want to add, Jonathan? Uh, that's well said. And it leads into uh, another question here, which has been answered by John in the past. And it's. Uh, I just lost it in the chat. It's about. Um, yeah, it's from uh, Kellen. Have we seen um, evidence of North Korean supplied ballistic missiles? I'll just try and bring it up because I have to scroll the way up. But um, yeah, this one here. Have you seen any evidence of North Korea Iran transfer ballistic missiles to Russia yet? Uh, John, correct me if I'm wrong here, but John did a, a piece on Tochny about a month ago confirming the use of North Korean uh, Iskander-type weapons, uh, ballistic missiles to be precise, uh, used, used against Ukraine. And uh, we've also seen those used against Kharkiv, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I I I think John was like confident enough to say that it was, but I'm not sure that like it would hold up like at the UN if you showed them pictures of it and like said this see this serial number it's North Korean or something. Um, but yeah, I think John seemed fairly confident. I, I remember what you're talking about. Um, as far as like actual um, like you know stuff that like countries have have taken to the UN to try to prove that North Korea is selling Russia ballistic missiles. I know that they were taking like satellite imagery of container ships, like moving to Russia, right? And we have clear evidence that Russia provided um, North Korea with pretty substantial technology transfers and um, like refined uh, petroleum products, right? So North Korea, um, you guys might know this, but just in case you don't, um, has like a real problem with, it's a very mountainous country. They don't have a lot of arable land. And so they need a lot of like chemical fertilizers. They, they don't have their own oil, right, or ability to refine it. So they need a lot of like chemical fertilizers and, um, you know, in order to fertilize the land and also to like, they need gasoline or diesel to like run the tractors to like have a mechanized agriculture that could produce enough food to feed their population. So um, it seems like Russia is providing pretty significant support to North Korea. And that would imply pretty heavily that North Korea is providing something of great value to Russia, right? Obviously, they're providing um, some crappy artillery shells, but that doesn't like, you know, that's like $2 billion worth of artillery shells. It seems like Russia is giving them more than that. So um, I think all that to say, it's like heavily, heavily, heavily implied um, to the point where I think we can basically say it's happening. Um, here on Tochny, but in terms of like a foreign government making the accusation to Russia and, and North Korea and having it stick like at the UN, 
I don't think we're quite there yet, but that's just my take. Um, yeah. You guys uh, have anything you want to add about that? Uh, not about that, but I would have something uh, actually just to, to add just a small thing about um, the energy uh, crisis, I would say. If, if that's okay, but okay. we can do the because we just had the question, you know, and um, I just want to add when I can share my screen for a second. Do, 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 do. Hold on. Okay. Um, just to to give you um, a small information, for example, um, when these energy blackouts happen, um, there's a lot of donations going on for um, generators and, and other stuff. Just to name one example from Germany, because, you know, I'm just focusing on Germany. I'm sure that other nations are also providing a lot. Um, the TRW, uh, which is the Germany's Federal Civil Protection Agen uh, Agency, um, disaster relief, if, if you want to explain it like that. Um, they, for example, in February said that they are providing uh, a, jazz, uh, a gas generator, um, a very powerful one, um, for a, um, donated by Audi, by the way, the, the car brand, um, to the front line in Ukraine for a hospital. So it's powerful enough to, to fund, uh, or this is the one here, um, to actually um, power a, a whole hospital at the front line, and um, but this is where the don uh, the donated generators and stuff like this gets bundled, right? It's it's always like when you donated a power generator or something else, it's always for critical infrastructure or for um, like hospitals or, or other things, right? Um, so it's not like nobody's supporting Ukraine with um, energy like generators, transistors, or spare parts for all these kind of stuff. Um, but they are getting bundled at um, locations where they don't reach or mostly don't reach, at least my opinion uh, or experience, the um, civil population. So the households still have no power, but when you go to the hospital and need something, there's everything uh, powered. J just wanted uh, to, to add that. And um, I don't find it anymore, but um, the EU, for those who don't know, um, they have great overview. Um, here we have it. I think it was, this is the last update um, made. Um, the EU actually published the map, um, not only with generators and transformers, but also with um, other stuff like medical ev evacuations. Um, this is one of my sources for my reporting for, for my personal project, for example. And there you can see that actually a lot of countries are donating power generators and uh, um, and transistors and uh, transformers, sorry, um, stuff to Ukraine. And um, you, you can actually look that up how the numbers are evolved. Um, you see that divided by every country, for example, to take Poland, right? They have uh, donated 568 generators to Ukraine over the course of the war via this EU mechanism and um, also 404 um, transformers. And, you know, Latvia, uh, Latvia, for example, donated a couple. And, you know, ju just to, to give you an overview. So there's consistent a consistent flow of generators, transformers, and other equipment for infrastructure, for power, for the power grid and stuff like this. It's just, you know, it's just not enough. But aid is coming. Just really wanted to point that out because, you know, in, yeah. in, in my opinion, a lot of people think that nobody's aiding you to Ukraine. I think it's just not possible to actually replace everything right now. At least in my experience. No, yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, as you said, it's a good example of something that, like, there's a lot of countries donating this stuff. Um, like, I mean, even Switzerland, for like countries that would be very hesitant to donate, like, military aid, this is something that's very easy for them um, to provide humanitarian aid. And this is one of the avenues that humanitarian, like, for example, um, Serbia uh, yesterday, I think, um, underwrote 37 million of their budget for humanitarian aid for Ukraine, which, like, blows my mind, right? So even in Serbia, you can get a little bit of tra political traction for humanitarian aid. Um, so yeah, like like you mentioned, a lot of countries are providing this stuff. 
as far as I understand, I'm certainly not an expert in how this equipment is like produced and stuff, but you already, I think, laid out the case pretty well that um, this is sort of emergency stopgap stuff for critical infrastructure. It's not really um, making it out into the regular population. Um, and then also that this equipment is, it's very specialized. Um, it's manufactured only by a few companies and it's very expensive and it takes a long time to like make, like there's not just a bunch of it laying around, right? So as you said, like it's just not quite enough considering the, the amount of um, the scale of destruction that Russia is leveling on Ukraine and the amount of power generation they need to uh, make up for. Yeah, I agree. Next question, Jonathan. <laughs> right. Well, as I just scroll through the comments here, um, I'm going to go to the first one that catches my eye, which is from Paul Gilbert. What happens with the North Korean ship that was stopped in international waters the other day? Did they manage to search it? Uh, well, I'll have a go at this. Um, unless... Uh, there was a, unless James Bond managed to stop it, I haven't heard anything. What about you guys? No, I haven't. No, when, it, when you anything. said you you were going to feel that, I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> 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 you hadn't heard anything, and I was like, oh, me neither. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, Paul, we can't answer that one, but we will endeavor yeah, we'll look to into do it. I'll say, I guess at the very least I can say I've been paying attention on Ukrainian Twitter. I haven't seen anything like, bob up to the surface of ukrainian twitter regarding it so i would imagine that you know probably nothing happened but uh obviously i don't want to assume that um but at the bare minimum it it didn't make enough waves to like make it to ukrainian twitter on uh by either the the twitter of ukrainians or like pro ukraine twitter uh, so in the meantime i did some googling um of course i just want to highlight nobody of us has um worked in detail on this right it's also when i'm just referring um to this um it's it's just googling i have not not a lot of details on this but it seems like um that south korea is investigating an unflagged cargo ship over north korea sanctions breach and took it to a harbor in south korea that's what he's talking about so there's actually an instance um but besides some basic Google information, I can't say anything about it. Yeah, I, I hope they find stuff. I Actually, now that you mentioned, I do remember that they mentioned that they seized a ship on the basis of the UN like charter saying, you know, you can't you can't give web. They passed a resolution in the UN that basically said North Korea, you can't give missiles to nobody. And, uh, you know, they basically said that South Korea or other countries have the right to search North Korean vessels. Um, like on those grounds that they suspect uh, weapon transfers. So I, I remember that South Korea like asserted that right to do that based on the UN um, resolution. But yeah, I don't know the result. I think I have to imagine they're they're conducting a very thorough investigation right now, um, and maybe we'll find out if uh, something something was there. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. Let's also quote it in in the article, like under UN Resolution two three nine seven, adopted in two thousand seventeen, nations have the right to detain, inspect, and seize any vessel within their territorial waters if it's uh, suspected of engaging in illeg uh, illegal activities with uh, North Korea. So it seems. Um, I don't know if, if, of it, uh, if it was the case, but it seems like the vessel was actually within South Korea's territorial waters and not international one. Yeah, At least sense. when they are quoting this um, resolution, right, it would make sense. Yeah, and that was silly of North Korea if they did that. But um, I think I have, unless you guys have anything else about this, there's a related question. Go ahead. Okay, so Ozzy Bugga asks, uh, South Korea produces some useful military gear. Yes, they do. Um, I was told they have a constitution that prevents export of arms to a nation at war. Is that correct? So I'm certainly not an expert on South Korean arms or on their laws, but I have heard this come up in a few conversations. As far as I understand, I for, man, I had the exact wording in my, uh, I look, actually looked up the exact wording, but, oh, I actually, I think I remember it. So the law says that they can export, they can only export weapons for, quote, peaceful purposes. 
<laughs> so, I mean, I'm sure it makes more sense in Korean, but at least in English, I'm a bit pr propounded by that statement. Um, so, or confounded. Um, so I, I think, I mean, I, as far as I can tell, they mean like defense when they say that, but in practice, it really like, you know, on paper, yes, they have this law that says basically they can't supply weapons to something like some a country in Ukraine situation. In practice, as far as I understand, historically, they violated that or they, you know, they, I shouldn't say violated it. They've, they've found ways around it or they've decided to define peaceful purposes differently, right? So as far as I understand, the law itself isn't really that important to why South Korea is like decides to send weapons or not. Um, so that, that would be kind of my, my like, uh, discussion of the law itself in terms of like, how, how can South Korea help Ukraine? So, I mean, we already mentioned today in, in my news report right there, they've contributed 2 billion. They very clearly recognize a linkage between the North Korea problem and uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, so I think that they're pretty active in that situation. I think we're probably going to see more indirect help from North Korea than anything else. So I'm certainly not an expert on this, but I know they have like joint production contracts in Poland, I think to make some tanks um, because Poland is like an insane collector of tanks. They've got like, they're running like five different tanks right now. <laughs> it's pretty nuts. Um, and I think we're going to see more of that. We're going to see South Korean partnerships with other European countries uh, because it just makes economic sense to do it that way. And as a result, those countries will be able to help Ukraine in like directly, right? Um, I don't think we're going to see a lot of like direct help from South Korea to Ukraine. It's just I for for whatever reason, I'm I'm not sure politically. It seems the same with Japan. They have these um, these ideological or uh, geopolitical or or constitutional hurdles in their society that seems to prevent them from being all in on 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 ukraine um which i guess you know makes a certain amount of sense considering like how removed they are from the region but beyond that it's a bit perplexing to me um i i think i mean basically i absolutely agree with you um but in the case of south korea i mean a lot of people forget that they are basically at war with north korea um so I can understand that they're not giving really much away or they don't want to publicly admit that they give something away from army stocks or from reserves, whatever, right? Because that's crucial information for North Korea. Um, for other countries, of course, it doesn't count. Um, in the case of Japan, I, I would also assume that's the same case, not, not the exact same case, but the same case with North Korea and Russia. Um, but, um, yeah, ju just want to, to highlight that. And also what I find quite inter uh, interesting is, um, that these, like we don't send weapons into conflict zones or to, in, into an active war zone or whatever, right. That actually reminds me of Germany in, in the early stages of the war, like in the early weeks, you know what I mean? When, when Germany, um, had the excuse of, uh, saying, yeah, we don't send weapons into conflict zones. Um, despite uh, despite us actually making exceptions, for example, for the uh, Pashmerga in in the fight against the Islamic State uh, a couple of years ago, where we also sent like hand grenades and uh, pistols and stuff like this. Of course, no big aid, but uh, you know, um, helmets. Yeah, I believe we also sent helmets. Uh... <laughs> of course, you did. Yeah, um, but w when it's always about these helmets, I always point out, and I need to do it now, I always point out that the delivery of these helmets was agreed in January, so before the war started, and the first military aid to Ukraine during the war was anti-tank weapons and uh, man pads. Yeah, so everyone is just focusing on these helmets, which were agreed on before the war started. Of course, it's not our, our brightest... Uh, day you know or, or brightest moment um but the first aid was actually you know anti-tank weapons and um stuff to shoot down helicopters and and you know so hey look people need helmets i'm not i'm not saying they don't yeah helmets are available right you you probably know that famous image of the ukrainian soldier with that uh german helmet and there's a fucking bullet in his helmet it was yeah, what he was one of touch these first pictures of the week yeah i i proposed that yeah i remember um yeah. 
he, he would be dead without it. Probably save five thousand lives. Of course, it's it's nothing compared to, to tanks or something else, right? But yeah. a lot of people underestimate trained personnel and to prevent trained personnel being lost. Definitely um, glad you guys have ramped up from helmets. <laughs> yeah, I would say we made we made a little step. <laughs> no, 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 it's 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 great. Um, but back to South Korea, like when I say it reminds me of Germany, um, I think South Korea, I can understand why they don't want to publicly admit that they are sending military aid to Ukraine. Um, but when it comes from industry, like when they are, I mean, they could, for example, say we're investing these billions and these billions into the industry, like Germany for, uh, does, for example, or did in 2022 yeah, at the start of the beginning. Um, like there was no big aid, of course, also big aid, but not as much as people has hoped for from our army stocks from the Bundeswehr. Um, but we made a lot of contracts with industry in, in Germany and in uh, Slovakia, France, you know, we made contracts everywhere for Ukraine. And these exact contracts are now um, paying back, you know, now the delivery is um, mid-2023, now everything is going to be Ukraine, to Ukraine from these contracts. And I think that's the option for, for South Korea. And I think they just need to go or undergo this political change um, they just don't do it because what, or in my personal opinion, right? Just my personal opinion. It's for the same reason, as you said, they're far away from Ukraine, right? Like how many hours, how many thousand kilometers away from, from Ukraine? It's that, of course, they don't care as much as, uh, Europe does. And it's just natural in my opinion. Yeah. And I, I wish, you know, I mean, it's perplexing to me, I'll be honest, like, if I was Israel, I would say, hey, Iran, every drone that you send to, or I guess, like, hey, Russia, every drone that Iran sends to you, we're going to send a drone to Ukraine, right? Or like, North Korea, you're going to send 2 million shells to Ukraine, South Korea is going to send 2 million to Ukraine. In other words, like, South Korea lost that North Korea lost that military capability when they sent those shells. Like, I think it's okay for South Korea to lose some shells. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, you mentioned the contribution. Yeah. It's, that seems logical to me, but I mean, these countries seem to have this view that like, Nope, it's complicated. We've got our own problems. I mean, obviously South Korea is looking at the, the Korean peninsula right now. Um, you know, North Korea is developing um, weapons that are kind of concerning. I'll say like John um, is typically quick to dismiss um, dumb missiles and stuff. And John seems to think that uh, Ukraine or sorry, uh, North Korea's uh, new weapon systems are a bit spooky, at least when it comes to threatening Seoul. So, um, you know, it's understandable that they're a bit like worried or, or that like Ukraine can seem very far away when looking at their problems. Right. But um I would hope that like people there have a bigger strategic view of the situation and understand that like weakening Russia now is important <laughs> for dealing with their problem later. And I think we're seeing that. I mean, there's a reason that at the NATO conference, South Korea made a big point to um, demonstrate at least some pretty significant support for Ukraine. So I think, as you said, they're slowly coming around. I think the longer this happens, it goes on, like the more they'll be on board. Um, especially the more like North Korea gets involved, but um, it's going to take a while and I'm not like super, I don't think we, we're going to hold out for like uh, South Korea to, to get super involved, honestly. And you yeah. know, it's, it is what it is. Yeah. And I just want to uh, highlight that in my opinion, I hope, or I, I wish Daniel was uh, here, but um I, I don't think that the quality of military aid is also um, like evaluated or taken into account. Like when you say, basically say an eye for an eye, right? Like South, uh, North Korea sends a thousand shades to, to Russia. South Korea does the same. Um, I don't think that you can compare the, the actual quality of these shells from North Korea to South Korea, right? And I don't mean that in, in terms of South Korea should send less. I mean it in... it takes them way more efforts to actually replace the military aid they have given to Ukraine than North Korea does. At least in, in my amateur personal opinion, I would think that because we all probably have seen how low quality the North Korean shells are, right? I, I would assume yeah. that actually replacing them, doing the production locally in North Korea would be 
way, way, way faster than when South Korea tries to replace, like, a, a, let's say, 100,000 shells they have given to Ukraine. Yeah, I guess we can just call it a proportional amount, right? I guess like that would be what I would like to see. I would like to see, you know, South Korea and Israel just say, look, our obviously publicly sworn enemies are giving Russia stuff and they're getting technology from Russia. So in order to, to deter Russia from giving my enemy, i.e. North Korea or Iran, technology that I don't want them to have, I'm going to make it hurt when they do that. So, yep. you know, that would be like my, I would give some kind of proportional response to deter that behavior. But, you know, what do I know? I'm not Israel or South Korea. I'm sure they've got big strategic plans and conferences and think tanks and whatnot. So, yep. you know, I'm not an expert, but that would be my own like hot take on what they should do, right? Yeah, absolutely agree. And um, it might be a bit um, off related, but it's somehow related. Um, I didn't include it in in my news report um, because I didn't. I actually didn't even tweet about it um, because I thought it's not significant enough. And you also didn't include it. Um, Scholz was at a at a not meeting um, like in his party at. A, Jesus, I want to say propaganda meeting of his party. No, it's not a propaganda meeting. Um, there was a meeting of his party, right, outside of Germany. Anyway, he was visiting there. He was doing PR, you know. And in front of all these people, he said one thing where I said that it is actually the right approach. That is what everyone should do, but it's another politician not living up to, how do you say it in English? Not put the money where their mouth is. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So he he said that the war could be over when Putin withdraws his troops from Ukraine immediately. And it's not the first time that he said that. But he said one thing, what, what I see, and I'm a close observer of him, right? What I see, he never said before, and that's, uh, but Pol uh, Putin only would do it if he sees that he can't win militarily in Ukraine. And That's basically what you say, right? We have it to we have to make it as costly for Russia as, as possible. And it's it's always crazy that all these statements are being made by by other people in this time it was Scholz, right? But then you see that you don't live uh, or you don't put your money where your mouth is. Because when he says that, yeah, then go to, to, I'm not saying it's a game changer, but then deliver towers to Ukraine, for example, or contract 100 Leopard, new, newly built Leopard tanks uh, for Ukraine, put some big orders, you know, that that's what I mean. And that also goes for other countries, not only for Germany, but for other countries. And because he's absolutely, in my opinion, he's absolutely right about that, right? Putin won't end the war unless he sees that he can't win this war. But right now, in with with that, what we are doing, I mean, the situation is improving with each day spent, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, just dragging on, just dragging on. Yep. Um, so I think there's just like a, a related matter, which is uh, I just saw us in chat some talk about like, could we embargo North Korea? Could we punish, basically, could we punish North Korea somehow? Could we isolate them further for what they're doing? Um, you know, again, not a North Korea expert. I did some like Soviet studies in school and, you know, we learned a little bit about the relationship between North Korea and the Soviet Union. Um, so maybe I can like give some background here, right? So I think North, I guess like the, the TLDR is like, as far as I understand, North Korea is basically about as isolated they can as they can be. And that's more or less their own fault. Um, they, like, it's not necessarily because um, only of sanctions. Like, obviously, like the U.S. is not being part of the U.S. financial system is a big problem, right? But other countries have tried to have economic relationships with North Korea, and it just hasn't worked out for them. North Korea doesn't follow through on its agreements. So a good example of this is Sweden. Uh, they sold them like 7,000 Volvos or something in like 1970, whatever. And they were just like, all right, like you pay us over time. And, and North Korea was like, sure. And they just didn't pay them. And they were like, are you ever going to pay us? And they tried to get their money back for like 30 years. <laughs> and then eventually they just gave up and they were like, all right, I guess we never do business with North Korea again. Right. 
And I think that was the experience of like all the adult economies in the world dealing with this crazy permit country was that they just they weren't reliable to do business with in any meaningful way. Um, and they, they don't have a lot of stuff that people need. And so I think that's what's really interesting about this Russia thing is, um, you know, the Soviet Union collapsed and before they were being directly supported by like Soviet subsidies, right? Again, as I mentioned, like they need gasoline and diesel and they need nitrogen fertilizers made from like oil refining, right? Like oil creates a bunch of nitrates. They Russia takes that and in a very dirty, gross way, they make fertilizers out of it. And our own farmers in America buy those fertilizers because they make it dirtier than we are ever willing to make it. And so they're way cheaper. Um, so like basically Russia or the Soviet Union at the time was giving that away to North Korea for free and they stopped. And from then on, like North Korea was pretty much screwed, right? Like they don't have a lot of access to the international financial system. They can't just like buy oil from wherever they want. And they didn't have enough fertilizer to like, they could barely feed their population. And then they made a bunch of other dumb decisions we don't need to get into. Like the famine was sort of caused by some of their own internal policies, but a big part of it was like not being propped up by the Soviet Union. Um, China has been like a little, they've supported them a little bit, just enough to make them a bargaining chip on the table for their negotiations with the US and, you know, other Asian countries. But nothing serious has ever been given to North Korea by China. So like in general, North Korea is like about as isolated as you can get. And like, I will say like, I, you know, I, it's one of those situations. I hate to say you got to hand it to North Korea, but I think you do in this case where like they are that isolated and they still manage to accomplish some of the things they have. Like, I mean, there's no other way to put it that like the fact that they're developing missiles that are, relatively dangerous and the fact that even though a quarter of their artillery shells fail um they can make them right i mean it's it's a little bit impressive considering their level of isolation from the international um you know international trade and they're a complete autarky right they believe like in complete self-reliance and like to have a modern economy exist on those terms again i'm not suggesting that it doesn't come at insane costs but the fact that they're able to even make it function at all is kind of like uh, incredible. I think like it speaks to maybe the North Korean people them, or the Korean people, I should say in general, like I don't think Russians would be able to like, you know, pull the grass out of the streets and stuff every day like the North Koreans do. But um, yeah, I would say like there's not a lot we can do to isolate or punish North Korea any further. And that's the reason we've seen in our negotiations with North Korea in the past, like we try to induce them with good things. We don't have anything left to really, beyond kinetic measures, like beyond actually hurting them, you know, kinetically, meaning like with weapons, like we've done all we can. They're, they're, they're super isolated. So that leaves like, if you do something good, if you stop testing your missile, we'll give you some food. You know, that's pretty cheap for us. It's a small price for us to pay for them to stop testing their missile because then we have to test a counter missile that's way more expensive than just giving them a bag of food, right? So in general, I would say like my understanding of the current situation with North Korea, they're pretty isolated. I don't think there's any country even that I could point to that's like, you need to stop cooperating with North Korea. And they've sort of done that to themselves. They just don't, they're not capable of, of like cooperating on an international level. They, so they've resorted to like crime, like they, they're they famous in Asia for counterfeiting money. Um, like, you know, in you in Asia, everywhere I went, like ha handing someone a $20 bill, they're like checking it to see if it's a North Korean forgery. Um, and they're famous for like, you know, crypto schemes and, you know, extortion and stuff like that. So, yeah, as far as I know, they're 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 pretty isolated. And uh, yeah, nothing much we can do beyond, um, again, like you have to make it hurt for Russia. It's the, the thing that has changed in this equation is that Russia is willing to give North Korea stuff again because North Korea can has something they need, which is artillery shells. And I'm sure because we've seen with the arrangements with Iran, I'm sure they're paying out the nose for it. They're probably paying top dollar for those garbage North Korean shells, right? So North Korea is like, just like a lot of countries that Russia is dealing with right now, like India with the oil, like they're laughing all the way to the bank. So it's just kind of a weird side effect of the war that Russia is suddenly a customer that's willing to buy something that North Korea has in abundance. 
And, you know, I'm sure North Korea is willing to make more of this stuff. And in exchange, Russia's like, here's some diesel fuel, here's some gasoline, here's some fertilizers, and here's some technology for your, to make your missiles shoot better. Um, and, you know, that's really bad for us. So what the only thing we have control over in that equation is, again, we have to make it hurt for Russia. Okay, you're going to supply the rogue hermit state of North Korea with a bunch of weapons and more like capabilities so that they can hurt South Korea more. We're going to hurt you if you do that. We need to deter Russia from helping North Korea. And, you know, the 90s, they were on their ass like they weren't helping them, right? So that would imply that we need to, A, knock Russia down a peg economically, and B, um, deter them through like acts of deterrence. When they give North Korea stuff or trade with North Korea, we should probably... Uh, you know, uh, induce them to stop through actions like, oh, you're going to trade with North Korea, we're going to give Ukraine more stuff, or, you know, we're going to do why.